Kia ora. Welcome to episode 73 of the SWNZ podcast, the podcast for New Zealand Star Wars fans. My name is Matt. And my name is Christy. Another very interesting week for news from a galaxy far, far away, so let's jump in and talk Star Wars. First, we're going to have a bit of a quick roundup of Star Wars related production news. Then we're going to take a have a quick conversation about new released product, newly revealed product. And finally, we will have a bit of a conversation about what we saw last week in episode three of Obi-Wan Kenobi that streamed on Disney Plus last Wednesday. We will be discussing spoilers when we get to that section. Leading the news roundup for this week, coming up this weekend, the Auckland Armageddon Expo will be taking place at the Auckland Showgrounds starting on Friday night, so June the 10th, running through to Sunday afternoon, June the 12th. The main news of relevance to the STMZ podcast is that a late addition to the guest lineup, Giancarlo Esposito, who plays Moff Gideon in The Mandalorian, will be holding a virtual panel. The timing for this at this point is penciled in for Saturday morning. Giancarlo's done a couple of virtual panels at previous Armageddon events. We have been to at least one of those and enjoyed it very much. He is a entertaining panelist and we're looking forward to seeing him at the Auckland Armageddon this coming weekend. Yeah, it's fun. Up until very recently, we weren't expecting there to be any Star Wars related guests. Obviously, most international guests are still not able to attend because of travel restrictions and just complications. So it's fun that we've got at least one appearing virtually and one that we have seen before at different events. So for those of you who can't travel to some of the other smaller events around the country, Auckland is one of the bigger ones. We're expecting a good turnout this year, though we've never held, we've never... We've never had about this time of the year in Auckland. We've never had a winter get-in before. This is the inaugural winter get-in. So it'll be really interesting to see what the turnout and the sort of vendors and, and cosplay and everything is like, but at least there'll be some Star Wars elements there. There will also be a fan-made pod racer exhibit, a sort of a life-size display to go check out as well as the usual sort of 501st Rebel Legion costumers. Uh, We're hoping there'll be a good amount of sort of Star Wars product at vendors, considering the amount of stuff that's sort of been coming out from The Mandalorian. You know, maybe a bit too early to see Obi-Wan Kenobi series merch, but I'm hoping to find some some good, good deals in amongst the vendors. That kicks off on Friday night with a bit of a preview evening. We will be reporting on Friday as soon as we return from that about what you can see and what you can expect to see in terms of Star Wars product and content from from that event on the actual Friday. And the other thing, we'll be doing other additional reports later on through the weekend. Next up in the news, the Obi-Wan Kenobi streaming series on Disney+. Plus. It's had three episodes to date. Official reports describe it as the most watched Disney Plus original series premiere globally to date, based on hours streamed in its opening weekend. They did release two episodes on the Friday, so that gives it a little bit of a boost, but it is not the only Disney Plus original series to have released with a double episode. All in all, this seems to be a very well received and watched series, and Although it has been described as a limited series, we're you know, officially at this point only expecting one season. Ewan McGregor has, on more than one occasion and more than one manner, described that he would be keen to do subsequent episodes, subsequent seasons. And there's even a little bit of conversation out there in the rumor mill that his second season has been greenlit. We'll take that with a grain of salt until we get a little bit more of an official word. But it would not be surprising if, based on how well this does, that we don't see other Obi-Wan Kenobi stories starring Ewan McGregor down the line. I'd very much like that personally. Back when Disney Plus and the concept of Star Wars live action series were sort of being talked about and the rumor mill was really getting going, Obi-Wan was the series that was the one in the sort of the rumor mill list that I was the most excited to ever sort of see and eventuate. I really enjoyed Boba Fett, but I always knew that Obi-Wan was higher up on my personal interest list, being so sort of closely tied to the prequels and Obi-Wan just being one of my favorite characters anyway. So yeah, I'm not too sort of tied into the idea of there being a second season. I know that, you know, these writers and, and just the way that the story may sort of wrap up may be very neatly. And it's one of those ones where sometimes you don't need to force more to the story but then of course you know as Star Wars fans we always want more Star Wars so I wouldn't exactly be upset if they you know surprise announced hey this one did so well we're gonna make a season two. Yeah well just in terms of possibilities with with the other live action series that have come out so far we've got this sort of notion of continuity between seasons 
Obi-Wan's life, the way he leads his life, is a bit of a nomad and he's taken this as a singular adventure off planet. Sort of lends itself to separate seasons that could just be quite circumscribed and not necessarily strongly related to each other. To him, it's not inconceivable that we'd get something that's kind of thought of as limited seasons, but more than more than one of them. All right. Coming up in September, Disney Plus celebrates its anniversary with an event that they call Disney Plus Day. And on Thursday, September the 8th, which will be the official the official Disney Plus Day leading into the D23 Expo this year, which takes place September 9th to 11th, Disney Plus will actually launch a number of premieres which they will be announcing over the next coming month. The titles include material from Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, National Geographic and Star. Based on what we have learned from the scheduling for material that's coming to Disney Plus from the rest of the year, it's quite possible that that September the 8th date will in fact be the premiere for The Bad Batch. Yeah, that'll be quite exciting. Most of the time when US sort of announcement dates include fall, I generally think more towards sort of October, November. Fall in America is traditionally tied around Halloween and Thanksgiving. They tend to also release certain content around these dates because they are holidays. Holidays in the US tend to lead to sort of more watch hours or more money at the box office. For example, uh, sort of the July 4th weekend is a big box office day yeah. for Americans. They try and sort of compete to see which which title can make the most money releasing on that date. So this would be fun if they sort of shift it a little bit earlier for the rest of us. We don't need to wait so long. And it does make sense for them to tie in new content so tightly to their own conventions rather than just randomly or and especially since Disney seems to be pulling away from San Diego Comic Con yeah, and trying yeah. to do their big content and panels and announcements at the conventions that they directly profit from and sort of benefit from such as Star Wars Celebration and D23 Expo. So nothing solid at this point in terms of actual titles but that that early september little bubble of time september the 8th for disney plus day and the d23 expo 9th to the 11th we're going to expect announcements and potentially premieres showing up on disney plus one way or another there will be an interesting time for star wars material all right i want to talk a little bit about taika waititi's upcoming star wars film i've got quite a few bullet points here that sort of are interesting to sort of unpack and have a conversation about now, the release schedule for this, not 100% clear. It's been described in different instances as being in 2023. That was the time, it was the time slot originally slated for the Rogue Squadron movie. But a recent article on Wired.com describes it as potentially 2025. We'll have to wait and see how that sort of solidifies. But if we have a conversation about what other things Taika's actually up to now and where he's actually got room to make a Star Wars movie, that might give us a little bit of a clue as to when we can expect to see it. Now, first up related to this, the trade publication Production Weekly that lists productions taking place predominantly in the US has a number of Star Wars titles described. One of them is an untitled Star Wars production that we don't know. It doesn't necessarily relate to something that we've been aware of to date. And there is a very, very good chance that that will actually be Taika Waititi's film. And that means that it will start formal production later on in this year. That production weekly listing it does list the filming location as Los Angeles. As I say, no start date is mentioned. If it is in Los Angeles, then it very likely makes use of the volume, which is set up there. Something that Taika Waititi, as we know, is very familiar with, given his work on both The Mandalorian and he used it heavily in Thor, Love and Thunder. As to when Taika is going to actually be available to start filming, here's a couple of other clues. Bespin Bulletin reports that he may very well be filming in New Zealand on the Apple TV series Time Bandits, which will be starring Peter Dinklage. This is a remake of the 80s from memory uh, movie. He'll be starting filming on August. He's working on the pilot in particular. And that films through into early 2023. Waititi is serving as the director of the pilot of the Time Bandits series, as well as a co-writer and executive producer. Before the end of 2022, he's also going to be a little bit busy promoting his next theatrical release, his next film, which is called Next Gold Wins. It's about the American Samoa national football team, but that's going to keep him a little bit tied up for the latter portion of 2022. Now, in relation to his work on Time Bandits, interestingly, he has been in New Zealand in the recent past. The New Zealand Herald has describes him as visiting a couple of venues in the South Island, looking for what are presumed to be filming locations for that uh, series. 
So he's probably going to be tied up, but in New Zealand working on Time Bandits in the first instance, and then will only likely be able to move on to working on Star Wars once that is cleared off his plate. It's really exciting seeing him working on so much material, but uh, we would, of course, really be keen to hear more about what he's going to be doing in terms of Star Wars. But I think it's going to just be a little bit before we uh, have a little bit more clarity on that specifically. It's a little bit easier to sort of play the waiting game when you know that people are busy and you can see what they're working on. You can sort of see how their schedule's panning out. Sometimes when we know, like, with the Patty Jenkins Rogue Squadron movie, it's not exactly clear, you know, they're not saying, oh, she's going to do this, this, and this, and then she'll be right on it. You think that because they put out that sort of teaser that they would have been, you know, that the wheels were solidly in motion for her to start production on that. It seemed a little bit of a a misstep to sort of give such an obvious teaser for that only to shelve it it feels like for for a few years now it feels like we should be leaning on up to sort of hearing more about that maybe even teaser trailer but of course we know it's not even sort of started production at this point so yeah at least even if Disney and Lucasfilm aren't giving us solid dates for some of these theatrical releases at least we can sort of follow along and put a little bit of the puzzle pieces together ourselves and go, yeah, yeah well, we, we can see he's busy, we understand, on one, on one but hand, it's imminent. On one hand, he's been described as one of the busiest people in Hollywood, and that sort of description of what he's got on his plate kind of backs that up. And on the other hand, he gives interviews where he says he's the sort of person who feels like he has never worked a day in his life. He just, it all does seem to flow naturally for him, and he's pretty good at moving from project to project and um, seems to tackle these really big tasks and projects fairly, fairly effortlessly just because of his style and approach to it. So yeah, so things, so despite the fact that he may be appearing to be very busy, he could just move through these and get onto the Star Wars project fairly, fairly promptly and efficiently. Okay, let's have a bit of a conversation about recently revealed products and local store reports. First up, Starting just recently, Obi-Wan Wednesdays are taking place once a week and they are focusing on revealing products related to the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. There were a number of new items that we found out about last week. A couple of new pops, pop vinyl figures that are actually already available in New Zealand for pre-order. A version of Reva, the third sister with lit lightsabers and Haja Estri, that's Kamal Nanjiani's character as in pop form. Very fun on both counts. More Black Series figures have been revealed. There is Obi-Wan Kenobi, his Tibidon Station version. This is the version where he has a sort of a blue top with sort of a brown wraparound scarf over the top. It's a nice variation on his plain brown Jedi-esque Tatooine outfit. Black Series Obi-Wan Kenobi Darth Vader was revealed and is available for pre-order on a, through a number of New Zealand retailers, including Mighty Ape, as are a number of the Black Series Inquisitors. We've got each of the Inquisitors represented in a black series form. Mighty Ape has some of them. EB Games, at a slightly higher price point, has has the rest of them. So check out those retailers for or to build up your set of black series Inquisitor Inquisitor characters. Also revealed on Obi Wan Wednesdays were a number of children's lightsabers under the sort of Saber Forge brand. These are quite plasticky, so they're not really for the collectors, but I'm sure kids would like them. And they come in a number of different styles, so kids get the opportunity to sort of choose and craft their own lightsaber to suit their personality and personal tastes. It's kind of fun in that regard. It's certainly come a long way when, you know, it didn't seem that long ago where if you wanted a few lightsabers at the warehouse, there was like two, a blue one and a red one, you know. Mm. The hilts were just like generic or it was just sort of classic like a Qui-Gon style, you had a Darth Vader style and some sort of mashup one. Yeah, Yeah, it's really fun to see because, I mean, yeah, if you're a Star Wars family, got Star Wars kids, a lightsaber is kind of the go-to and you don't want to give them FX saber level ones. They just need some plastic ones to run around in the backyard and it's great that they're coming up with some really interesting designs so it doesn't feel like you're just getting the same ones over and over. Also from the Obi-Wan Wednesdays was a reveal of the Vintage Collection Obi-Wan action figure. This has got an August the 1st release date. It's available for pre-order in New Zealand as well. $33 from Mighty Ape, for instance. Let's talk a little bit about the latest HasLab project. We, we've discussed this a podcast or two back. It was revealed as being the Reva Third Sisters lightsaber. It's got quite a high price point on the HasLab website, US $599. It's open for 45 days until about July the 12th, and it needs to hit a threshold of 5,000 backers to go into production. 
at the point when we last discussed it, there wasn't a New Zealand retailer that was going, that was going to carry it. But EB Games has stepped up and has it listed on their site. They have it listed for $1,099, however, and that requires a $200 deposit at the time of pre-ordering. At the time of recording, the number of backers for this project hasn't quite hit 1,000 and we're about 10 days into it. That means it's growing at a rate of about 1,000 per 10 days and there is only about 35 days for this project left. So at its current rate, we know these do pick up at the end and it's not a straight line in terms of the number of backers, but it can get quite quiet through the middle. So this project is far from guaranteed. 35 days to go, 4,000 more backers required and it's currently growing at 1,000 backers per 10 days. It, it still feels like a little bit of a, a sidestep. You think that the first two very successful Haslab Star Wars projects were both for the three and three quarter inch sort of uh, TVC line vehicles that are generally too big to just put on regular toy shelves. The Rancor for the Black Series was the first stumbling block here where it didn't make production, people weren't happy with the prototypes, the bonus tiers for hitting sort of subsequent numbers of backers and you think that they'd take a step back and go okay maybe we're not quite on track here go back work, yeah. to let's go pick a star wars vehicle that's never been done before go do darth maul ship or something like that you know do a one-to-one -one scale sort of you know in the in the four inch figure line a vehicle that's never been done fully to scale do something cool like that you know because well, a classic character it's not, we're not, or we're not, we're or not. go back to the drawing board and do a fan vote. Would they do fan votes with action figure lines anyway? And yeah. I'm like, pick, put five starships up and go. Which one would you guys like? You know, ones that have you know possibly a couple of characters or a couple of little accessories and things like that that you could add on. Going all the way left field. Well, one more another, I need to do a little bit more research. We're not saying by any stretch that the, this third sister's lightsaber shouldn't be built because absolutely it should. Uh, it's a very cool, very cool in a, in a black series form. I would, I would think we love the black series lightsaber, the newer ones in particular. But it's a, it's an odd, it's not unique enough to do as a Haslab project. I think what got me was when when they sort of announced the concept of Haslab, it seemed like a way that we would finally get some of the big ships and big sort of components to a, a four inch figure line that were just sort of cost prohibitive or just tricky to do any any other ways. And they do them on a pretty slow cadence, really, you know, one a year, and then it takes a, even a little bit longer for you to get it on your shelf. And I think every time they take a detour, it, we know that as fans, that's another year before something else will be offered to us. You know, yeah, it's like a lot it's, of downtime. it's yeah, yeah, it's going to take us even longer. And we're like, no, no, no. There were so many cool things. I'm sure fans have just got huge big lists of all the vehicles and things that they could build. You know, there are buildings, ships, all sorts of structures and things that they could give us as part of this. And lightsabers was just sort of quite left field it's not at all what i was expecting when i sort of saw the rumors going around i was going well that would be an odd step for hasbro but then and the rancor was, was a life, was yeah. a has was a weird step for hasbro so yeah it'll be really interesting to see and talking about this in the swnz facebook group it does bring up some interesting points for local collectors. You know, we only tend to uh, be familiar with Star Wars Haslab releases, not as sort of in tune up to the minute on some of the other franchises. And we're hearing that they did have the Rancor, but the Rancor was EB taken. Games, sorry, yeah. EB Games had the pre-order for the Rancor. EB Games tends to just have, I guess, a slightly higher distribution volume between Australia and New Zealand. Well, they've got a stronger they are, purchasing power, so they've been able to make bigger deals, stronger deals with Hasbro. And they have a relationship with GameStop in the US, so they've got a little bit of a pull power yeah. in the way that Mighty Ape, a smaller, more locally based retailer, doesn't seem to. But we certainly, just from our own past experience, do prefer working with Mighty Ape. They do tend to sort of, they come through on their pre-orders but we're getting a little bit more feedback about some of the other HasLab projects from non-Star Wars franchises where they were fulfilled on the sort of broad HasLab scale, but EB Games just decided to basically cancel the orders that people had had, even though the HasLab project went through. And they had taken deposits. And they them. took deposits. So now these people are getting their deposit back for an item that was actually successfully funded. But and now yeah. they're just going to have to go and pay 
reseller of value because everyone is sold out. You know, once that ordering window closes, people don't keep orders open. It's trickier, but it is possible to get these direct from Hasbro. You just need to have, in one form or another, a US shipping address. So it would be super frustrating. We haven't experienced it personally, but we understand that others had super frustrating to put down a deposit to get it locally through EB Games and presume that that is going to come through and then have the rug pulled out from you and you've missed your window to get it purchased directly from HasLab. That's a worst case scenario. Yeah, it's like what Adidas did with the Star Wars Boba Fett mm-hmm. shoes some while ago and EB Games did it again with the Jedi Knight Revan Black Series figure. You, you give them your money, it's everything's confirmed, you expect them to follow through because they took your money, only for weeks if not months to pass and then they go, oh actually we're not going to get that in, here's your money back. But you know by that point it's sold out everywhere and you're stuck buying it from the secondary market which for these highly collectible items is always going to cost you more. And part of the benefit to ordering from a local retailer is just customs and freight. It's a little more scary because these things are big, heavy. I don't know what the box for the Reva lightsaber would be. I mean... It's going to be bigger than what we've seen so far. It's going to be bigger than the Darth. Yeah. Bigger bigger than the Kylo Ren. Not necessarily heavy, but dimensionally, lightsabers are a bit of a weird one to ship internationally. They are quite long boxes. I'm sure the blades will be removable, so we'll still be dealing with a similar length box. But the width of that hilt makes it kind of a big one, which, depending on the freight carrier you use, can go up in price, depending on the length of the shipping box and stuff like that. So it'll be really interesting. We're keeping an eye on this. This isn't one that's destined for our collection, but I do want... We'll yeah. monitor it. We'll discuss it in subsequent podcasts. Just to keep an eye on it's the likelihood it will likelihood it will come through. Because, like I say, I, I think it'll be actually a nice saber if it was made. I just wish it wasn't Haslab, and I wish it wasn't quite as expensive. But for the sake of the fans out there that really, really want that for this collection, I do hope we don't see another failed Star Wars Haslab project. That would be that would be unfortunate and and you know quite a disaster in some people's eyes. And if they do get it from EB Games, I hope EB Games follows through. Yeah. It does make me wonder, based on sort of chatter that I heard about during the Rancor HasLab fiasco, was how many people basically placed duplicate orders, one to keep and one to basically store aside for a while, knowing that these aren't things that will be restocked. The HasLab projects are sort of one and done. And so people that can have the money to sort of invest in these things, they buy one, they put it aside for a year or two, and then put it out on the secondary market to make a profit because you know the demand will be there for the people that missed out changed their minds and are now seeking one out so you do wonder how many of that just under a thousand orders is true actual uh people you know mm. but the, uh, are there a thousand backers are there like 700 backers and mm. you know a, a, a couple of hundred of them are buying two to, to sort of you know hedge the bets on on the secondary market and also there are no tiers for this no no bonuses so there isn't like an incentive to sort of rush i know for the other ones if you thought you wanted this you would jump on as early as possible because you wanted to see the number of snowball and hit those subsequent tiers because suddenly you're getting more action figures for your same amount of money there are no tiers on this so there's no rush for it so it'll be really interesting to see if this speeds up if it's going to just grind to a halt Uh, we definitely be keeping an eye on it i just I'm just not sure where this one's going to go. It's going to be an interesting sort of topic to to come back at when this closes, whether it's going to be successful or not. Yeah. All right, let's talk about other fun, positive products that are available. Most of the exclusive pop vinyl figures from Funko and soda pop collectible figures also from Funko that were revealed and available at Star Wars Celebration are now available for purchase locally in New Zealand. Four individual characters, Stormtrooper, Chewbacca, Princess Leia, and Luke Skywalker. Slight variants on existing on existing sculpts, I believe, but they in particular come with a silver base. There is a five-pack that also includes Darth Vader, as well as those aforementioned four characters. They have a long, continuous base, also sort of silver in color. There is a, I think they call them Pop Rides. It is uh, Lando Calrissian in the cockpit of a Millennium Falcon. And finally, there are two variant soda pop collectibles, Boba Fett and Luke Skywalker, with comic book style paint apps. They're available through Mighty 8, Pop Stop, and a number of other retailers. EB Games has them, I believe. The long five-pack 
it seems to be uh, restricted not quite as available but that is up for pre-order that one's coming in a little bit later from mighty ape and pop stop yeah, this is one of the first times where almost all of the Funko exclusives for Celebration are available locally. Interestingly, that long continuous base five pack didn't actually make it to Celebration itself. I saw people talking about they, this they online, that the stock was delayed problems. and wasn't yeah. actually available. They had to cross it out on the sign on the very first day of the convention because obviously people were keen to get their hands on it and they're like, sorry, this one didn't arrive in time. You're going to have to go buy that one online, which is kind of God. And I really do appreciate Funko for doing this. I kind of wish that some of the other licensed companies would do this as well, where they're like, okay, we're not expecting people in all the other countries around the world, especially during a pandemic, to make it to celebration. So they're basically the way that Funko tends to do most of their exclusives. Uh, if you're in the US, you can do retailer exclusives, you can do convention exclusives, but for everyone else in the world, you guys can just have it, you know, with the special stickers and whatnot on it. The one that I know that is definitely going to be that sort of elusive, true exclusive, it was the Diamond Grogu Pop. Mm -hmm. I saw people really fighting for this one, trying to get their <laughs> hands on it, and it's going for many monies on eBay already. So if you are a Funko completionist or desperate to get your hands on this, it doesn't look like that one will show up locally at all. That one was a sort of a true, true exclusive. Only, yeah. So you'll have to hunt that one down. There are a number of them on eBay, but it will cost you a little bit. But I am excited that most of the other ones are going to be available locally. Slightly higher price than just a standard Funko, but the extra of 4 or $5 is nothing compared to the, the flights to actually attend Celebration in person. So take that as a win. Okay, from Hasbro, the latest in the prototype edition line in the 3.75 inch scale action figures is Luke Skywalker Snowspeeder Pilot. We haven't seen these prototype editions available for New Zealand retailers directly before. There's been a number, Boba Fett, Stormtrooper, Chewbacca, etc. He's available from a number of local retailers, EB Games and Mighty 8. Mighty 8 has it for $33. That'll be available on October the 1st. So just as a reminder, these are vintage style sculpts. The figures come in brightly colored, varied variation colored, arms, legs, body and head to sort of represent and capture the the old uh, prototype figures that were just cast out of random plastics to test molds and and production equipment back um, back in the or during the production process. So they're referred to as the prototype edition. There's been a number of releases previously, but it's fun to see them. And Luke Skywalker prototype edition is an interesting interesting addition because all the previous ones have been based on existing vintage Star Wars action figures. This is Luke Skywalker Snowspeeder pilot, a little bit different from the Luke Skywalker X-wing pilot vintage sculpt. The recently revealed Deluxe Vintage Collection Dark Trooper with Charging Bay out on the 1st of October went up at a number of retailers. A little bit of a controversial product because this is a very highly priced 3.75 inch Deluxe figure set. I think it's about $63 from Mighty Ape. It comes in, a, in an opaque box but the only thing that makes it Deluxe beyond having a standard figure in it is this Charging Bay. You can army build with them and join the Charging Bays together I think. I think the fur comes with interchangeable hands and a few weapons, but not, not a lot of playability or diorama uh, play value beyond that. But having said that, I know that even the retailers are a little bit frustrated at the prices that they are having to pay wholesale from, from Hasbro. So this isn't strictly a retailer a retailer problem. And I know, I believe that um, some of them are even you know, bringing that up with Hasbro. There is a chance that we may see a price drop on that. So if you do pre-order it through Mighty Ape, there is a chance that you will actually have the price reduced before it is released. But we'll keep an eye on that on the website and report back if we do see a price drop. That is coming from Hasbro, that sort of price increase rather than the retailers per se. I know that, you know, sort of recent world events have made items, production, shipping costs, all of that kind of stuff is, is kind of snowballing to the point where the consumers are ending up having to pay more. We're seeing it with groceries and stuff like that. But I remember back in the old sort of prequel saga figured series where you'd see like a Yoda, you know, on card and he would be the same price as that enormous lump of plastic effant mon because you know and it was like they were the same price hanging on the cards you know there was clearly a big difference in the amount of plastic and materials going into this so this one considering that for a while there particularly when those five point of articulation figures were quite common that we were getting figures in that kind of 16 dollar price range you know and it felt like a 
breath of fresh air after some of that that sort of time period where it felt like the three and three quarter inch figures were sneaking up around 25 some places were getting close to 30 dollars and then suddenly it felt like we jumped down yeah, to look, sort of 16 and 17 dollars and it was like yes thank you this, we're finally getting back to normal now 63 dollars yeah. because this whole deluxe concept where it's really just a singular figure with a few more accessories than than you might otherwise get and it's not even that more, many more accessories on the whole there's instances where it's actually comparable to other things we've seen in the past just released as a standard issue release uh, it's not going down well with, with collectors on the whole no especially since you you can understand like and maybe a two-pack going yep. for like 50 or something like that there's articulation there's face paint you got to do but this is literally a piece of wall well, you know it's, it's, not, it's not articulated it's black plastic with a few details on it yes it clicks together but it doesn't move it doesn't have the fiddly details that you would expect an action figure to have so this is this is priced more than a two-pack yeah for a bit of wall really well, the counterpoint is if we see smaller characters for instance we, the black series omega recently she at least came out with her little lizard companion and a very nicely sculpted electro bow accessory yeah. ultimately we're inevitably going to see a princess layer action figure in vintage collection and black series and if, if they're going to if they can believe they can justify charging 63 dollars and calling something deluxe because it's got a few additional accessories and a little bit more plastic are we actually going to get a price discount for a figure that has less plastic in it i don't think we will no no yeah i can easily see them deciding to charge us full price for a little layer figure with at this point they've put lola in with obi-wan they'll yeah. probably put lola in with leia as well and just and that's go just that's plastic. all she's got yeah. <laughs> all right but on the other hand it's quite fun to see a number of other black series figures still being released from a number of other different movies and streaming series titles Coming up in the very near future, we've got Ayla Secura from Attack of the Clones, Magistrate Grief Karga from The Mandalorian, and Darth Maul from Clone Wars Season 7. They're all available for pre-order locally right now. Coming up from New Zealand Mint, a number of legal tender silver coin products coming out over the next month from their upcoming products description page, from their coming soon product page. Chibi coins will be being, being released on the 14th and 28th of June. We're not sure on which of those dates we can expect to see a Star Wars character, but it will be on one of at least one of those. Faces of the Empire, the coin that we're expecting this month will be a Phase 2 clone trooper. One ounce silver coin due out on the 17th of June. And later on, on the 22nd of June, we'll be seeing a Bo-Katan from the Mandalorian in the classic coin line. So you're probably going to get uh, gold coins as well as silver coins for Bo-Katan. A number of new Star Wars Lego sets have been recently revealed and there are five different sets currently available for pre-order on the official Lego website in New Zealand. Some of these are quite interesting and exciting. From the Andor series already, a scene from, based on a scene that we saw in the trailer, there is a set called Ambush on Ferrix 75338. We mentioned this a podcast or two back. 679 pieces at 129.99 New Zealand dollars. This has the sort of dropships that we see in the trailer and a number of named characters as minifigs. From Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Inquisitor Transport Scythe Vehicle, 75336 is the set number, 924 pieces for 169.99. Uh, comes with the Grand Inquisitor and a couple of the other Inquisitors and that's a, a cool uh, rendition of the Inquisitor ship in black plastic. Brickhead's line brings a two-pack of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader, set number 40547, 260 pieces for the two characters, $40 for that direct from the Lego store. A life-size BD-1, set number 75335, over a thousand pieces, $169.99, very well articulated, and this is a character that translates very well into Lego form. That one's definitely on my wish list. And harking back to Attack of the Clones, interestingly, Obi-Wan's, Obi-Wan Kenobi's Jedi Starfighter, 75333, 282 pieces, that's $60, comes with a torn wee yeah, minifigure, uh, an astromech and Obi-Wan Kenobi himself. It's very cute, I like seeing torn wee rendered in, in Lego minifig form. So that's a, a 280 piece Jedi Starfighter, so a little bit smaller scale uh, compared to what is possible in the minifig scale, but still quite a neat little set. 
All right, let's jump in and talk about the most recent episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi, episode three, that screened last Wednesday on Disney+. Plus. We are going to discuss this in detail, so if you, if you haven't seen it yet, rush out and see it, then come back and listen to the rest of the podcast where we'll be going through our thoughts on all the detail, which will include, obviously, spoilers. A quick recap of the key events, and then we'll break down some of the fun details. In the opening scenes, as well as Leia and Kenobi coming towards the mining planet on a automated transport we see an interaction between Reva, the third sister and Darth Vader where Vader instructs Reva to find Kenobi promising to promote her to Grand Inquisitor if she succeeds in parallel with that Kenobi and Leia they're approaching the rendezvous point that has been provided to them by Haja Estri they find that no one is actually there and I think it's Leia's idea that they actually take a ride on what turns out to be an Imperial transport some interesting interactions with stormtroopers which we will go into they are ultimately discovered by the imperial troops looks like they're going to be captured but a female imperial officer by the name of tala is in fact a member of the underground network who has the role of hiding dissidents and outlaws hunted by the empire for sensitive outlaws that are trying to escape from the empire she escorts them to a secret subterranean passageway but before they can leave darth vader and the inquisitors arrive on planet and in an attempt to call out Kenobi they begin to or Darth Vader quite gruesomely brutally begins to harm bystanders to lure Obi-Wan out Kenobi sends Leia and Tyler ahead while he provides a distraction he comes face to face with Darth Vader who overpowers Kenobi force chokes him and burns him wants him to suffer in the same way he believes he believes he suffers as a consequence of Kenobi's actions Tyler provides a bit of a distraction to help save Kenobi and Leia is left to try and escape on her own and and is ultimately intercepted by the third sister. Really, really interesting episode. We had some really quiet moments, some quiet interactions between Leia and Kenobi, which were just fantastic. I really loved the interactions, the portrayals of both of them. Some real strong emotions and some really, really key moments that Vivian Lara Blair manages to convey exceptionally well for for her age and then the counterpoint to all of that is some really really powerful brutal again with an emotional underlay interactions between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi in particular. Let's start at the beginning we see in particular a lot of conversations a lot of dialogue directly between Leia and Kenobi both as they approach the planet Mapuzo secondly when they discover that the rendezvous the person they're supposed to meet at the rendezvous, rendezvous point is not there and then ultimately on the transport when they're trying to Avoid detection by the stormtroopers. Yeah, just before we jump into that, I just thought it was interesting that we again started out with Obi-Wan trying to yep, contact sure. Qui-Gon through the Force and yet again proving unsuccessful. I feel like the the number of times that they have referenced this, oh, they, they well, can't leave it too much longer for him to do it. Can. Or maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, we will just finally get it in the, in the final tell episode. My but, mind, oh. Tell you what crossed my mind. It looked like he was trying too hard and I thought I thought immediately when they sort of showed that he was trying too hard that that would not be the point at which he succeeds mm. I almost yeah. thought that it needs to come during a time of more peace more peacefulness and, and less effort um, he's still got a lot of inner turmoil to deal with and clearly that is hampering his ability he's been uh, they haven't outright said he's been sort of disconnected from the force, but we know from his exertion trying to sort of rescue Leia from her fall, it does not come naturally to him, so he is at least very much out of practice. The implication is that he just hasn't used the force at all in the last decade. Yeah, so it's sad. We do get some moments of, I believe it's Yoda, Anakin, and Qui-Gon's voices, but this is exactly taken from some of the prequel movies. So the memories, yeah, than... it's memories. Not these aren't voices through the force to him or anything like that. He's just sort of, you know, reminiscing on all the sort of the tragedies that transpired earlier, especially centered around Anakin, because yeah. you know he's still grappling with finding out that he is alive. And on that point, on that sort of notion about what it's going to take for Obi Wan to to communicate with Qui Gon potentially, uh, there's other instances where he breaks his calm where living by himself and the guilt that he's going through the frustration he's been through he is not he's not at the most peace with himself or or his life at this point and that kind of breaks through in his interactions with Leia every now and then which is just an interesting little sort of characterization yeah in a moment where she still sort of believes that people are good he kind of snaps at her and says like not everyone is good Leia and you can see he's just carrying a lot of hurt 
he as a Jedi you want there to be sort of you know peace and love that's you know that's the light side of the force they want everyone to be good and he's obviously had to learn a very very hard lesson very personal hurtful lesson and he especially knows how that has affected Leia and her life but it's interesting to see him sort of snap you know the Jedi are sort of very reserved very yeah. controlled um, and we're seeing that yet again this is this is a very broken Obi-Wan even you know to the point where he's snapping at a child who is just that kind of got that youthful optimism where she hasn't really learnt the hard, and she hard lessons she doesn't, she doesn't take it too hard she yeah. almost understands what's going on there the other thing that came through really strongly early on was 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 you know, an aspect of Leia's character when things look the most futile she, she she takes action she still has hope she takes action and she takes control ultimately Obi-Wan's almost given up she goes she sees the transport and goes running to the transport it's almost a um, detention block grab the blaster someone has to save us moment yeah yeah I thought that that was fun that even though she's young she's not the grown up in the situation on a foreign planet and she's never left her She's never left Alderaan before, and she doesn't seem to be completely sort of freaked out on this sort of wild adventure that she now finds herself oh. on with what is essentially a stranger. She's she's picking up the fact that Obi Wan knows her that that he that he has more connection to her family than he's letting on, but he is still essentially a stranger. You know, she was literally running away from him. You know, what would have been you know a few hours or days earlier. So it's interesting to see the way that she's switched into okay, you know, planning mode. I'm gonna. Take, take control the way that we see her in A New Hope. So I thought that that was, that was fun. And they're not the most perfect plans that she executes, but they, they are going in a direction. So she is trying to get, get somewhere in terms of progress and goals. And yeah, and I, and I really like the way that, as I say, Vivian portrays, portrays Leia's enthusiasm and, and hope and character overall. It was really cute the way she delivered some of those lines. <laughs> Almost loses it and describes Obi Wan as her her friend, but corrects immediately to father. And, and that sort of complex sort of delivery of lines was was very very well done by a young actor. So they get on the back of the of the transport, and uh, initially they're by themselves, but they determined very early on because of the flag, the emblem that is on the back of the on the back of the tractor, the Imperial insignia. That the driver is Imperial aligned, and in fact he's running through a path that he presumably does on a regular basis and picks up stormtroopers and gives them rides from you know checkpoints or from a to b as as required he's very clearly a an imperial aligned player at this point don't think we initially don't think there's anything necessarily sinister coming from him directly but when he stops for stormtroopers to get on board uh yeah everyone's a little bit on the edge of their seat i like the moment where leia and, and obi-wan are sort of talking in the back and and they're trying to sort of play along in front of the stormtroopers, but he calls her Leia, and you can you can't quite hear what what Leia is saying, but you know she's like trying to sort of basically reprimand him, like you called me by my real name, you know, you said my name was this. You can see the sort of expression on her face, and the, I thought that was a really kind of cute moment that even she is she's a little bit more focused she's a little bit more sort of onto it and you can see that obi-wan has still got inner turmoil and it's distracting him to the point where he's letting his sort of letting his guard down letting some things slip in yeah. front of stormtroopers no so less he manages to recover from that but that leads to i don't know one of, my, one of the most heavy hitting sort of double taps in terms of plot developments you know bits of dialogue in the entire episode because he covers his tracks by making reference to the effect like Leia Luma's fictitious mother being called Leia, but he delivers the line that Leia reminds him of her mother, and he's talking about this fictitious mother for the Stormtrooper's benefit, but he's also clearly talking about Padme, and um, Leia interprets that, and when they have a brief moment later without the Stormtroopers, she does ask him, did you know, did you know my mother? And yeah, that's a fantastic delivery and a really, really, really interesting moment. Yeah, his voice changes when he's when he suddenly references the mother, and you can see it on Leia's face. She's picking up on the fact that she she knows that he's that he's hiding something the whole time, but it's almost as if she's caught him in a moment of truth. 
that that he's that he's being real with what he's saying and he says oh that was just a story i was sort of telling for the stormtroopers but you can tell that he's not trying too hard to convince her it was just made up because he can probably sense or just realize that he that he's sort of let his guard down and she's caught him and realizes that he was telling the truth and it'll be interesting to see because they've done this a couple of times they've basically referenced padme with Leia sort of being and the connection be between everybody up to something bigger, yeah. yeah it makes me really curious to see where they're going to go with this whether they'll just be always kind of drip feeding sort of padme anakin bits and pieces throughout the series whether it will lead up to some sort of bigger dramatic moment we have seen them draw quite heavily from leia's costumes that we see her wear as a grown-up for the costuming that we see here as you know as a 10 year old it'll be interesting to see would we ever see her in something that is a little bit more reminiscent of something that padme wore try you know pull in a connection a little bit more strongly there especially since it's being brought in with the dialogue and the conversations that she's having with obi-wan um, and it makes me wonder whether they are going to lead up to maybe Obi-Wan is going to throw something at Vader, like taunting him about killing Padme and all that kind of stuff. Because we know we know that Anakin slash Vader is aware that she died, or at least, you know, he would have believed what Palpatine told him in those sort of closing scenes of episode three. But we don't know whether an, uh, Obi-Wan is going to be like, I was there when she died, you know, like you killed her, like, you know, throw a bit of emotional ammunition back at him because, uh, because, uh, we know that from later on, we know that Vader definitely wants Obi-Wan to suffer. He doesn't just want him dead, he wants him to suffer. It'll be interesting to see if maybe Obi-Wan will snap and and throw something back. Because they can't just be lightsaber fighting for three whole episodes. It'll, no, be yeah. it'll be interesting to see, because in this episode, we do see them, you know, being in each other's presence, communicating, fighting. They, I, I don't know how they're going to... I'm really, really keen to see how they're going to... Develop that. Food, develop yeah. that. Yeah, we can't just have them not interacting and then have another final fight. You can't keep throwing them together and then just make up ways that they don't kill each other. It'll be really... No, it's going to be some proper progression. I wasn't expecting them to actually put them together so soon. Yeah. But yeah, we're jumping ahead a little so, bit. <laughs> before we get to that, the, um, the tractor, the troop transport or... Approaches a checkpoint, a laser gate checkpoint. So this is obviously just sort of a, a, a customs checkpoint. It's not, it's not insurmountable, but it's obviously just designed to um, stop vehicles from getting through. Interesting and interesting development later that it is a laser, a laser fence. Uh, but at this point, we learned that the driver of the transport, Freck, is um, he dobs them in, so he's not not on their side, and he's not actually believing that they are innocent. He thinks they're about they need checking out. Very cool scene here where a probe droid comes out and it's obviously one of the ones that has been programmed by the Inquisitors to search for Obi-Wan Kenobi and send out to a number of different planets. We do hear in parallel with this that they get information from the probe droid later with that Kenobi has been spotted and positively identified so then they know his location. Yeah, um, we see the kind of the viewpoint from the probe droid. Um, as the stormtroopers are sort of instructing Obi Wan to lift his hood so that the probe droid can get a sort of a good clear shot of his face, and the viewfinder kind of goes red, yeah, it's like a it's hit, yeah, yeah, it's detected him as as a as a Jedi target or identified as Obi Wan, and this is obviously the moment where Obi Wan's like, okay, I'm going to have to start fighting. But interestingly, he pulls out his blaster, not his lightsaber, for this scuffle. Yeah, a lot of hand to hand combat as well. I find it very interesting to see. Obviously, Kenobi's used blast of a four on on screen but it's fun to see him uh, fighting hand-to-hand combat you don't see jedi do it a lot they rely on their lightsaber so fun to see him doing that hand-to-hand martial arts style yeah he's not combat. even really sort of using the force pushing yeah. or pulling or anything like that he's still just sort of brawling yeah so they do manage to take out the stormtroopers one of them falls from the tower and gets uh, bisected by the laser gate just a little bit of an interesting portrayal there <laughs> Yeah, we don't really see... I mean, it's kind of funny because uh, video games, Star Wars video games, tend to have a sort of a sl- uh, sort of a heightened violence. There's 
the the force powers are sort of exaggerated what you can do with a lightsaber is a little bit more graphic than what you ever see we see obviously limb dismemberment in the movies we see I think Darth Maul is probably the, perhaps the most gruesome. I mean, yes, we do see Anakin lose his limbs, but yeah, there's something about sort of the... Yeah, that was cut in half by the gate, by the door in yeah. uh, Mandalorian, but that was, they, they cut away before they showed that. This one was, uh, this one was, was quite evident, quite yeah, interesting. Yeah, it felt like, felt like something you could do in the video game, and, and it was just kind of obviously not too close up, so it felt too gory, and, yeah. and these are... Stormtroopers always feel a little bit Expendable. sort of... Yeah, because you don't see the human face... But it's the same way it reminded me of some of those video games, particularly in the sort of the Jedi Outcast era where you could sort of turn on sort of lightsaber dismemberment effects and, you know, you could <laughs> cut the stormtroopers up. And it was just kind of one of those, oh, they actually went there kind of moments. You know, they didn't sort of cut away or just sort of imply that, oh, you maybe got sliced in half. They showed it I top think, down. That... And then later on, when they are sort of running around by the gate, you see him lying in two parts on the ground. Yeah, I think it does does speak to the weight of the whole story in, in some ways that uh, Darth Vader, as we will see later, is not, he's not just, we see his violence, we see his pursuit of revenge, and it's just kind of letting the whole series, you know, speak to that tone. It's a very sort of brutal time. We know in A New Hope, Obi-Wan was talking about before the dark times, before the Empire, that he sees this as a real dark time. And we're sort of seeing the brutality of just day-to-day life and existence. We're seeing lots of battered, worn people sort of cowering in... in, I mean, in sort Empire of, is trying to establish itself and it's yeah. um, doing so with force and it's trying to do so quickly. And there's a lot of people who um, are victims as a consequence of this. Every time we see the Inquisitors or Stormtroopers in like a city street, these people are all sort of cowering and running away. They're not trying to fight back. They're trying to be sort of escape the wrath and get out of sort of sight. These are people that are that have, you know, possibly tried and failed to resist the Empire in the past. And they have learned pretty well that there's pretty good odds you'll get killed if you don't try and hide or just stay out of their way. So this really is sort of this constant sort of reminding everyone that this is a brutal time and a little bit of a stark contrast to the sort of the dinner party that we saw on Alderaan that Leia has not really seen this level of sort of brutality the the realism is this the sort of turning point where she realizes that people do need to rise up against the empire because she says something to Obi-Wan she's like I thought the empire was like trying to do good or you know bringing order because that's the kind of the spiel of the of the empire isn't it that we're bringing peace and order after the clone wars you know where the galaxy was upended and in conflict that spread across the galaxy and the empire was supposed to bring order you know just one rule no no fighting and stuff like that you behave and we'll look after you and she's learning that that's not the case she's been very sheltered on order run never made it off world and she's getting to see what happens that uh when you come across stormtroopers yeah, no, and right, inquisitors and everything like that so it'll be really interesting to see if we see her her mindset shift a little bit whether we see her make any kind of connection is she going to talk to her father because her father clearly has connections to the rebellion and sort of the underground movement here how much are we going to see her beginning days of involvement with the rebellion is she going to talk to her father do we actually see a connection towards the end of this it'd be really interesting to see if if we see that beginning spark for Leia yeah you're right that definitely seems to be where it's where it's heading from her point of view so once that first wave of checkpoint stormtroopers are dispatched, we immediately see a second wave show up in another troop transport. It looks like everyone and Leia are, well, pretty much lost the fight at this point because they're quite outnumbered and outgunned. But it turns out that the Imperial officer is in fact on their side. She shoots the stormtroopers in their back. They go down and she introduces herself as the person that they were supposed to be rendezvousing with that was going to be helping them get to the planet to beam which is their ultimate destination so fairly promptly without a lot of other sort of additional plot details they make their way into the outpost and they make their way into the secret hideout that is part of the underground that is being used to funnel force powered children jedi and such like to 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 a safe house some interesting development some interesting little bits of trivia in that uh, underground safe house first up they get the assistance from a non-speaking loader droid 
play or at least get introduced to him. He helps him in greater detail later. That's quite a fun interaction. Quite a fun notion that this supposed labourer droid that doesn't necessarily have the capacity for speech is somehow oriented with the underground, oriented with the with the Jedi escapees. And yeah, that, 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 that's developed even further, even further later. Once in the safe house, we get a little bit of reference to a number of other characters by way of scrawlings, graffiti type markings on, on the wall and a very fun reference to Quinlan Voss. Yeah, we see Obi-Wan sort of as he's being told that yes, even some Jedi have come through here. Uh, she references the fact that the sort of connection of underground sort of hideouts is called the path leading to a planet where they can kind of get, you know, uh, sort of safely hidden away but he notices uh, one of the writings on the wall is from Quinlan which is obviously a reference to Quinlan Voss a character that was kind of invented in the comics nearly appeared in live action form in episode three ultimately didn't make the cut they kind of sort of tweaked canon a little bit to make a sort of a background character in episode one reference to Quinlan because he his appearance in the comics was inspired by this sort of background extra with the yellow face markings. But it's really fun seeing him referenced so obviously and clearly and the fact that he is still alive and is helping younglings to escape. That's kind of a big deal, actually. We, we, we spoke earlier on about how the early episodes, the very first opening scenes, kind of let us know that the eradication of the Jedi was far, very far from complete, that there's a number of Force users and actual Jedi and named established high-ranking Jedi out there in one form or another we just you know in previous material we made aware of them they're in hiding and you know quite effectively but to know that someone along the lines of Quinlan Voss is actually out there and helping other Jedi escape there is this whole established path this whole established underground that kind of implies quite a lot is going on under the surface and it seems like a little bit of a surprise to Obi-Wan he he went into hiding, he gave up, and so did Yoda. You know, two of the most powerful of the Jedi Order that were still alive after Order 66. They were the only sort of council members we see referenced after Order 66. And I think he's surprised that there are Jedi, that there are others out there that are trying to do something to fight back, if not directly, but are still trying to sort of fight the good fight and rescue people. Because we find out from the female Imperial officer that even anybody that's force sensitive is being hunted yep. and she says that we don't know what happens to them when they are taken obviously we know that some are turned into inquisitors we assume that the rest would be executed but we are not exactly sure we don't know whether the obi-wan series will sort of divulge if the empire is doing anything other than just executing force sensitives it yeah, would be interesting i don't know what sort of numbers there are and yeah, yeah. What, what plans and potential there are for them but he seems to be kind of inspired to know that there are others out there that survived. We know that he came across the Jedi on Tatooine, but seeing like people that he knows, like Quinlan, um, it's it seems like it's sort of sparking something in him, and it'll be interesting to see where that possibly develops in later episodes. But I like the idea we hear from the Imperial officer that she joined up for the to the Empire. So she's not just running around with a stolen uniform, she is actually part of the Empire, but is using her position to kind of work the underground. You know, she's she's yes, she is wearing her uniform and being being an Imperial officer, but you she's know, seen she's light, yeah. she's she's realized that the Empire is not what they made out to be, you know, that they don't stand for peace and order, that it is oppression and and sort of death that they are dishing out and she wants to do something so rather than quit she's using her position to do as much as she can leia sort of asks her like you know aren't you scared but i guess we've gotten a hint from other books and comics that there are people in the empire that feel like they need to sort of atone for being a part of the empire that they have to sort of put their life on the line to try and rescue people because they feel guilty about what they contributed to as part of the Empire. It would be interesting to see if we see more of this character, whether she sort of comes along for the ride, what happens, because she's not dead. She's helping Obi-Wan at the end of this episode, so I do see, we, I do hope we see more of her. It, it gives sort of an interesting complexity to the Empire. We know yeah, that... Yeah, it's not a monolith. 
Yeah, yeah, that there are people, I mean, we saw it with Finn in the First Order, you know, these people that sort of don't know any different, and then when you get into it, and you're like, oh, I'm executing people, oh, maybe I don't want to do that. We haven't seen that in a live action sense as much. We get a little bit of it in Solo. We know that he joins up the Empire, and he's like, hey, I don't get what we're doing here, but that's Han Solo. We knew he, we knew from the outset, he's not Imperial aligned, you know, he's, he's a little on the fringe, you know, he's not exactly doing things for purely honest, he likes his credit. It's, but it's interesting seeing you know another take here yeah so so taylor's about to lead them down the tunnel way uh, when kenobi senses a disturbance in the force we cut back to the exterior shot of the the street outside the hideout and at first it looks like it's just the inquisitors that are appearing but um very quickly revealed by way of his breathing mechanism and ultimately his silhouette that darth vader is is on the planet he's come with a He's come with a backup squad of stormtroopers. It's quite interesting that, again, as we saw in Mandalorian, we have uh, planet-bound stormtroopers with their beaten-up armor, but they freshly arrived stormtroopers in their pristine white armor. So we've got these two distinct two distinct uh, squads of stormtroopers on planet. Darth Vader knows that he's seeking, pursuing Kenobi. And the Inquisitors are just um, holding back because Darth Vader wants to take this on personally. And one way or another, he, he is aware that he's kind of in the right place in the right zone That uh, because it's where the probe droid identified Kenobi is in proximity to this township, to this outpost. In order to draw Kenobi out, Vader is uh, getting pretty brutal. And in fact, he kills at least at least two, possibly three innocent bystanders walking down the street. And um, not just with sort of trivial snaps of the figure, he's quite tormenting. He's making quite a theatrical show of it all he's been, he's been doing very, making himself very very visible and trying to draw attention to it so that Kenobi will ultimately is drawn out to try and stop it yeah this isn't quite as fast paced as the corridor scene in Rogue One but in some ways it feels almost a bit more brutal because these are people that aren't actively trying to fight against him they are hiding they are not trying to resist they're not part of the rebellion or anything like that you know when he's taking down the rebel fleet officers at the end of Rogue One they are actively trying to steal something from him you know they're, they're trying to fight against him they're you know like they didn't exactly deserve the fate that he dished out but you understood the conflict here here he is toying with them he is clearly in a position of power and authority over them and he is just tossing them around like they're nothing and in front of people um in front of their loved ones you know that are and he knows that this is that this is going to like we saw in the very first episode where the inquisitors are trying to flush out the jedi they they threaten harm they know that that's going to bring a jedi out of hiding because jedi don't want their protectors and, and guardians So he knows that this is going to, and just before it looks like Vader is going to torment a couple that are cowering together behind some boxes, we can sort of see that he sort of reaches out in the force or kind of, you know, taunts Vader to grab his attention, to draw him away from the innocent sort of townspeople. So I think that's at the point where Kenobi and ultimately Vader end up a bit more in the sort of, in the mining facility. With yeah, the, he, um, he runs away from, yeah. from the town centre into sort of a quarry type sort of mining facility with, with sort of big... Um, big mounds of minerals and, machinery, and yeah. things like that so we're drawing away from from where other people could get hurt obi-wan has done this deliberately yeah so we kind of break into two two sort of sub plots here so we've got the vader and kenobi about to face off but just just to tie it up so we can talk about kenobi and vader in a lot more detail reva and the other inquisitors are looking around the town she seems to be more acutely drawn to the actual hideout where where kenobi and leia and tala were quite immediately i don't know if that implies that she had more information or a stronger a stronger sense that they might be there but she does discover the tunnel and it looks like she doesn't directly enter the tunnel and we find out later that she's um one way or another worked out where the other end of the tunnel is she's presumed or deduced somehow that it leads all the way to the spaceport but we'll come back to that so Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader facing off in the quarry yeah, there's a, there's a few moments where you think that, okay, they're going to start fighting, but Obi-Wan kind of looks around. He looks almost like he's fumbling with his lightsaber, like it looks foreign again, again, to, it looks to like him like in his hand. Again, it looks like he hasn't hand. switched it on at all yeah. um, at, up until this point. Yeah, he looks a little unsure, and that he sort of, I guess... I, I don't think he wants to face him. I, I think no. he knows he's not up to it. 
Yeah, but he also wants to just keep drawing Vader away because he he That's right. told he to Leia yeah. he told Leia to sort of make a run for it with Tala, try and get to the spaceport. So at this point, I guess he knows that there is a very good chance he will be caught or executed by Vader and or, you know, a, a lot of stormtroopers yeah. and is doing what he can to buy them time to to save Leia. He knows so that, he's letting, he's he knows that if he stayed with Leia, that Vader would just chase them, that yeah. she wouldn't be safe. He's engaging with Vader. He's letting himself be visible so that Vader is distracted and, and, and occupied, preoccupied. He um, avoids avoids some direct confrontations by, you know, smashing the, the steam pipes or whatever and, and just keeping it on the move on the whole. But Darth Vader does catch up with them. There's some cool quite lightsaber, you know, bits of choreography and just effects in the dark where they're really relying on the lightsaber light uh, to, to illuminate the characters and, you know, some quite artistic, funky... Well, this is in the new era where we saw in the, in the sequel films where they're actually on set with illuminated blades. Back in the old days, they were fighting with just very strong metal sticks. There wasn't any sort of actual real world lighting on them on set. It was all done sort of, you know, CG putting the blades in. So you didn't get the really strong sort of illuminations on the actors and sort of costumes in that until we get to, I particularly noticed it in that sort of Ray and Kylo fight on a Starkiller base. That's the first time you really see the sort of blades up close near the face. You're getting that blue and red. And we really see that used to effect in this fight. There was a couple of shots where both the blue and the red sabers were reflected on Vader's helmet. That looked really, really cool. It looked really quite uh, like a painting mm. almost. But yeah, the actual lightsaber clash when they when Kenobi does ignite a saber and Vader comes at him uh, was again very very interesting. Vader's effortlessly using a single hand. He's enhanced. He's stronger than he than he was. He might not be as fast. He might be still accommodating to his. Well, I guess it's ten ten years now. But even though he's still getting you know back to treatments on an ongoing basis, but he's strong enough to just be wielding his lightsaber one handed. While in contrast, Kenobi's clearly having to use both his hands and all his strength just to just to deflect and hold off and parry yeah. lightsaber blows the the relentless lightsaber blows from vader who's not trying to break through he is really just trying to wear kenobi down at this yes. point yeah he's not swinging to kill he's just kind of it it you it looks like he's taunting him and you sort of it, you know after a few scenes we realize why why he's not just single-handedly yeah. sort of taking him out He's so yeah, he's 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 just t- trying to tire him. He's trying to prolong it. He's trying to make a scene of it all. Yeah. Because he's got one hand free, he does force push Kenobi back at one point. And I think when that distance is increased between them, that is the point where Vader spills the the flammable crystals down onto the yeah, ground. Yeah, yeah, some sort of mineral that's easy to ignite. He sort of uses the force to knock this all across the ground. And at first, it's not exactly clear. It didn't. It doesn't exactly block the way or or sort of rain down on Obi Wan. But um, as he's sort of using the force to hold Obi-Wan aloft in the air to the point where it's sort of very reminiscent of the sort of Vader choking, you know, where he rises people up off the ground to fully choke them. He sort of dips down a little bit with his ignited saber and sets all the mineral on fire. It's kind of... quite a few things happen really, really fast. You actually see the sparks when the the saber hits the ground and we've seen sabers, you know, ignite sparks uh, elsewhere. So it's quite a really cool, clever sequence of special effects there. So it's at that point that Vader says, well, actually, there's a couple of lines that I just missed out on talking about this, the whole, you know, what have you become? You know, I am what you made me. A bit of dialogue sparring earlier on, but we get this once the flames are ignited line that makes it clear that Vader wants Kenobi to suffer as he did and not in a very specific way. He wants to he wants to burn him. Yeah, because we know that. Obi-Wan didn't necessarily, you know, set Anakin on fire, but there was a consequence of sort of dismembering him so close to the lava on Mustafar. But yeah, clearly uh, Vader has been stewing about this, his sort of torment, his sort of torture while Obi-Wan stood there. Obi-Wan, I guess, was quite capable of using the force to lift him away from the lava and put him somewhere else. But at the same time, yeah... Obviously, Vader has been has been uh, tormented by that sort of act, 
and is determined to yeah. do it uh, back <laughs> to sort of get his revenge. It's like, okay, you burned me alive. I'm going to do exactly the same thing to you. And it's pretty clear that he is, he's got a lot of dark things in mind for Obi-Wan. This isn't, this isn't the Vader that we see at the end of The Return of the Jedi who is conflicted about sort of witnessing the pain of Luke. This is somebody that is, no, he's hell-bent on causing pain and suffering. This is a very dark... The twisted way, the Vader. Was... The Vader that we always knew was Vader, but we've never really quite seen it on screen in a live action No, like he's this. not just a military leader. He's not just a strategist. He is driven driven by evil uh, in a way that's been described in words, but not, not as often really, really shown to this extent. One thing that really kind of struck me, and it did to a slightly lesser extent in the village scenes earlier, was when he's doing things to people, using the force to, to inflict harm upon them, it's not... It's not transient. He's holding Kenobi down. He's dragging him through the flames. It's a continual, persistent sort of act. And this, you know, the, the, I found the dragging of the person behind him, you know, kind of sort of brutal. It was so he did it sort of so automatically. He was doing other things at the same time. So it was kind of like second nature, you know, effortless to him to that extent. And, and that came through the way he held Kenobi down, dragged him through the flames across the across the crystals. Yeah. Yeah, he, it's it's like he's he wants to he wants to experience Obi Wan's suffering by having that kind of that that connection by holding him there. We know in A New Hope, Obi Wan describes him as twisted and evil, and we're seeing that. Um, you can only just imagine what's flashing through Obi Wan's mind <laughs> as he's talking to Luke about him, about you know who Vader is and stuff like that. And now we're knowing exactly the sort of things that that he is remembering, that he is reflecting on as he's speaking those lines. I can only imagine what is going to happen should Vader and Obi Wan clash again in the series and i i can't imagine that they would put them together in the third episode and then never again i, I get the feeling we're gonna have like a, a, a rematch as it were towards the end of the series i'm not quite sure how that's gonna sort of go they can't keep putting them together and having them survive yeah. but well, we do know now that vader isn't out to kill him outright so you could have a couple of conflicts where Obi-Wan, because Obi-Wan said, I cannot kill him, he's like my brother. And I don't think that even knowing how twisted and evil Vader is, he knows deep down it's Anakin. He knows deep down that's Leia's father, that's Luke's father. I don't think he could ever... I mean, that that is why he literally lets Vader kill him in A New Hope. He just he won't ever kill him. Yes, <laughs> we've got a lot to get through in the, in the next three episodes to really see how that... Now that ties into the, exist, the rest of the existing story. So Vader puts the flames out. Everyone can have pushed away from the, from the from the mineral spill. And Vader orders the stormtroopers to to go bring Kenobi's. I'm not sure if he's conscious at this point, but his unconscious body to him. It's, Vader's got in mind to take him somewhere. So he did have a plan in mind beyond just inflicting burns upon him. But Tala has caught up with them. She has discovered where they are. She shoots a stormtrooper. She reignites the flames. And through that distraction, Ned B, the loader droid, picks up Kenobi's body. And we presume a rendezvous with, with Tala. So the three of them are back together. And um, at this point, effectively, Kenobi has escaped from, from at least this interaction with Vader. Yeah. I, I do wonder why Vader didn't just sort of use the Force to drag Obi-Wan back closer to him rather than letting the flames separate them. But it almost it almost makes me wonder whether he doesn't care. He likes the cat and mouse. He likes the constant fear. He wants Obi-Wan to sort of fear him. He does um, want to prolong it and yeah, play, it, play it out. That he, that he honestly doesn't really care if Obi-Wan gets away. He knows he's alive. He knows he's injured him. And it's just kind of that... That taunting, ever-present kind of menace that's that's coming down, sort of after him. So I think, I think he doesn't actually care too much. He knows he's got the upper hand, and he's just like, okay, you can you can run off and. Because I think it's not fun if, like, you know, in, like, torture films and stuff like that, you 
the torturer doesn't want the torture e to die quickly and sort of escape the pain as it were he doesn't it, it's almost better if obi-wan runs off and heals a little bit because then he can torture him more you know so i don't think he's he doesn't seem to care he's just the the camera kind of lingers on vader's mask looking through the flames at obi-wan obviously he's not speaking aloud we don't know what he's thinking specifically i'm not exactly sure what they have in mind for sort of us to be thinking what is vader thinking about at this moment as he's looking through the flames seeing the the loaded droid sort of helping obi-wan is he is he scheming is he just like okay i'm you go you know and i'm gonna catch up to you pretty soon or is he is he second guessing what he what he was doing is he maybe getting a pang of guilt like i'm not quite sure I'm sure subsequent interactions that we see will give us a little bit more of a glimpse about how Vader is feeling. Is he even more resolved to torture and ultimately kill Obi-Wan? Is he starting to falter? Has he gotten too close to sort of feeling like, you know, what he experienced as Anakin? Is that jolting his memory about being Anakin? Is that bringing him a little too close to the surface? There's so much sort of emotion and inner turmoil in this. I'm hoping we get at least some sort of... um, bit of a light side ending even though we know that ultimately you know obi-wan yeah, dies yeah, vader well. dies we know where the ultimate fates of these characters are at the end of it all i hope that we just sort of get some lighter moments well we presume oh, i don't want to jump too far ahead we're going to presume that it's going to conclude at some point with with leia being reunited with his parents but i don't know where it's going to go i don't think it's going to be the the happiest the cleanest of endings for obi-wan uh, overall we'll have to wait and see how that pans out so yeah, at, at this point we know that Kenobi has basically, as we say, escaped escaped from Vader. But the same is not quite as true for Leia. She has made her way to the end of the tunnel. We can see as the camera pans around as this scene develops that she is in fact at the spaceport. But the person she was supposed to meet with, the pilot she was supposed to meet with, is dead on the ground. And it, and it is Reva, the third sister, who is there instead. Leia doesn't know her. She doesn't recognize her immediately. But uh, Reva does reveal herself to to Leia and basically has captured Leia at this point and that's pretty much where the episode ends. Yeah, it's we've got Obi Wan being quite badly wounded. He's still got all his limbs, but he's not feeling too good. He looks like he's in a serious amount of pain. And Leia is fully captured by the Empire now, so oh at least we haven't got too much longer to wait until the no, next these, episode. These episodes are I get they are cliffhangers, I guess, but they're they're more than that. They really make us want to see what's how it's going to continue. They're really hard to deal with the gaps between episodes. You know, they're not just a classic cliffhanger. You know, is something bad going to happen or not? There's, there's the whole story is hanging on a hanging on a thread for multiple for multiple players. Yeah, I could only imagine if some of the other Star Wars movies were released in episodic fashion like this. Like if you split up episode three and it'd be like, execute order 66 and then come back next week to see if any Jedi survive. Or, you know, like like it would be awful. Um, in some ways you just sort of want it all dumped down Netflix style. But I know... I know that Disney knows that they've got hot properties. They want people, if you string out six episodes once a week or even like that, that's more than a month, you'll get people subscribing for at least two months if they want to see all the episodes at the minute they drop. So it does make financial sense. Just uh, draws things out a little bit for us. But I do appreciate it for the fans that don't necessarily have the time the free time in their life to sit down and watch something for six or so hours you know that's quite a chunk most people don't watch more than one movie a night so yeah and at least you can't get too far ahead on the internet you know people can't jump ahead and just go oh, watch the final episode and go this be- is what happens and yeah well, no, and the, then whole run thing, off. the whole thing becomes an experience the whole thing becomes a process we, we take breaks between episodes we discuss it with other fans we discuss it in the podcast i think that it's just part of part of the experience and, and uh, yeah that's enjoyable and it's own right as frustrating as it is to wait between episodes but we're coming up on episode four we will talk about episode four in next week's podcast about this time next week uh, so everyone's had a chance to look at episode four if you do manage to watch episode four as soon as it screens that is our intention as well we do talk about it directly on our personal blog twitch account so that's the villa Varakino twitch account we will be doing a live stream where we play star wars the old republic but that is just a background that we use so that we can have a bit of a conversation about the episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi that is just streamed. So Wednesday nights, just after Obi-Wan Kenobi's episode concludes, jump on over to the Villa Veracuno Twitch 
channel and join into the conversation then you know th throw up your thoughts in the chat and we'll just have a bit of a talk about what we've seen straight after each episode yeah it's often fun because it takes a little a sort of a, a little bit of sort of talking about it to really sort of break down what you just watched the complexities the little things that you might have missed you know talking about it with people in chat and just sort of going through the developments the sort of things that made us laugh or surprised us it's it's fun while it's still fresh in your minds obviously by the time we record the podcast we've watched it two or three times uh, at least so we can sort of have a, a much sort of more thoughtful approach to discussing it but I do like that sort of fresh straight straight then straight after it's finished filming I was just sort of reactions on that note though that's about it for this installment I guess we are done doing talking thank you for tuning in we do appreciate you taking your time to listen to us share our passion for Star Wars stay tuned to our website swnz.co.nz for Star Wars news for New Zealanders and another podcast episode next week and every Tuesday don't forget you can jump on over to either our Facebook group or the SWZ message boards to discuss all the latest Star Wars news with other Kiwi fans. Kia ora, kia noho, haumaru, thank you for listening and stay safe. Turo Hawaiki, may the force be with you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, go ahead and like the video, check out the SWNZ podcast playlist for our other episodes and subscribe for alerts about new episodes. See you next time.